And hey, by the way, if you are not just new to Thrive, but you're new to church generally, maybe never been to church before, maybe you're kind of just curious, you're kind of like, I'm not even sure why I'm here, but I'm just kind of exploring, that is awesome. We love the fact that you're here. Maybe you're coming in from a different faith background. That's totally great. We're so glad that you're here. We hope you make yourself right at home. We hope that you find that Thrive is a safe place for you, a place where you can find some community, some hope to help you start this week. If you've got any questions at all, you can always email us at info at thrivechurch.ca. We're doing a series here at Thrive. We just started it. It's called To the Ends of the Earth. Everyone say, To the Ends of the Earth. It sounds like that Buzz Lightyear movie that's out right now, but it's not that. To the Ends of the Earth is a series we're doing on the book of Acts, one of the most powerful, adventurous, mysterious books ever written in the New Testament. And if you have your Bibles, you can even go to that right now. We're going to be in Acts chapter 4 today. And see, as we go through the series called To the Ends of the Earth, going through the book of Acts, we're going on a journey together. Maybe you hadn't had a chance to travel like you would like to this summer. Maybe because gas prices are so high, or hotel fees are getting higher, or because of maybe concerns with COVID, or maybe because you couldn't get that Airbnb, or maybe for other the reasons. You just couldn't travel the way you want to, or you have been traveling, but it hasn't been very energizing. It hasn't been very fun. Uh, it's been more draining and stressful for you. Well, guess what? I want to invite you on a journey together with us here at Thrive Church as we travel through the book of Acts. In fact, we're not just doing this on Sundays, but we're doing this every day. And if everyone say every day, And if you want to join in on that, if you don't just want to fly over the book of Acts on Sundays, because we're going to be going at a pretty fast pace, if you want to walk through the book of Acts with us, you can certainly do that. You can go to mythrive.info and subscribe for Pastor JB's game time sharing. What will happen is that every morning we'll send you a little passage from the book of Acts that you can read. And in case you're not really sure what I can learn from that passage, I'll send you a few thoughts on this is some of the things that you can learn. This is what it tells us about who Jesus is, how we can live in light of God's word. And so I invite you to join us for that as well. Are you guys ready for the next episode of our series, To the Ends of the Earth? Here we go. Well, over the summer, we have a team of speakers who will be helping us go through the book of Acts together, and I get to introduce today's very special guest, Pastor Nick Osborne. He is the pastor of Lighthouse Christian Church in Steveston, and every time he's here at Thrive, we are always super encouraged and blessed, and today to add to some of the sense of adventure uh, and danger to this book, to the series, because, you know, Acts is a dangerous kind of book, uh, you're going to notice something is that Pastor Nick, when he gets on the stage, he will be accompanied not just by one octopus, but many octopi, all right? You're like, what? Uh, You'll you'll see in just a minute, trust me. Uh, And so uh, Pastor Nick is going to be here to bring us into Acts chapter 4 today. And not only does he have a cool look, but how many you know that there's no one that I know who loves Jesus the way that Pastor Nick loves Jesus. He's got an amazing heart for people, and we're always blessed to have him here. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. And so would you please give God a big hand as we welcome Pastor Nick here in a special way. We're going to check this out right now. Let's welcome Pastor Nick. Let's give God a big hand and let's get ready for episode two of our series to the ends of the earth. Thanks everybody. Thanks Pastor JB for those kind words. Uh, It's always a pleasure to be with Thrive and it's a pleasure to be with Pastor JB. One of the things I appreciate about uh, Pastor JB is if, if you're ever feeling down If you're ever feeling a little low, just ask Pastor JB to introduce you to a friend and he will just inflate you with such encouraging words. Uh, You'll feel much, much better. So thanks for that, JB. And Thrive, it is a pleasure to be with you today in this new place. Well, it's new to me. I guess it's a few few months, couple months uh, for you guys, but wow, fantastic. What a gift from the Lord. So praise God for just how he is moving in this church Uh, in this people. And I'm really happy to be here as we continue through uh, Thrive Church's journey um, through the book of Acts. And and we're doing this series uh, to the ends of the earth. And this week, we're still in the early chapters of the book. We're in Acts chapter four to seven. And I, I, I just love the book of Acts. It's, it's the story of how the first followers of Jesus uh, lived out their faith. They lived out their, the new life they had received in Christ. And there's so much that we can learn from the book of Acts. And we can learn from the New Testament church because we live the same gospel that they live. And we are filled with the same spirit 
that they were filled with. But we also keep in mind that today we're not reaching uh, a first century Roman Empire. Um, we are reaching a 21st century world. And so as we learn from the New Testament church in the book of Acts, we always have to ask ourselves, what is God up to here and now? And how can I apply what I learned from the New Testament church through the journey of Acts, but how can I apply it in my world here today? And so just to give you a bit of background to Acts chapter 4 and 7, of course we know that, that the Gospels end with the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, and then there's these, these post-resurrection appearances as well. And then we get to Acts chapter 1, which is the ascension of Jesus. And so here, Jesus is moving from phase 1, where he's with his disciples in person, and he's moving to phase 2, where he's not with the disciples in person. And so right now, the disciples, they're, they're nervous, but Jesus says, don't worry, I've got this. I have a purpose for you, and I have a promise for you. And the purpose he gives them is to be witnesses. That's the word, the Greek word, martis. He says, you are going to be my, my witness. This is my purpose for you. And then the promise he gives is the promise of power, the word dynamis, where we get dynamite from. And he says, I'm going to give you power. The Holy Spirit is going to come. And so when we get to Acts chapter 2, is the coming of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church, and the new way the church is doing life together. And then we get to Acts chapter 3, which is important for what we're going to hear today. Acts chapter 3 is where we encountered this, this uh, crippled beggar who was, who was expecting a typical day of panhandling by the temple gate, but instead he got the blessing of a lifetime. The power of Christ, the dynamis of Christ, coupled with the uh, disciples' witness, or martis, and this man's response of faith led to this miraculous healing. And now the church is starting to grow exponentially. So then we get to Acts chapter 4 to 7, what we're going to look at today. What happens? Well, we can expect that if God moves in a mighty way, then God's enemy, Satan, is going to launch a counterattack. And so after Pentecost, after this miraculous healing, after this rapid growth of the church comes persecution. And Acts chapter 4 to 7 is the story of the escalating attack against the newborn church. And as we look at Acts chapter 4 to 7, we see that the enemy attacks the church uh, in three different ways. The first and probably the crudest tactic was physical violence. He tried to crush the church through persecution. In Acts chapter 4, the apostles get like a, a slap on the wrist, but the violence begins to escalate throughout the early church uh, the life of the early church. And so in, in Acts chapter 5, there comes a second wave of persecution. Then there's the murder of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And then Acts chapter 8 starts with another massive wave of violent persecution that scatters the followers of Jesus away from Jerusalem. So his first tactic was just violence, persecution. His second tactic he uses is a little more cunning. He uses moral corruption. So he's unable to destroy the church from the outside, and so he attempts to do it from the inside through moral corruption. And this is where we get the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. And then the third way we see the enemy attack the church, and it's probably his most subtle way, is through distraction and busyness. He tries to deflect the apostles away from their calling to prayer, to preaching the word, by preoccupying them with social administration and doling out food. And that's the story in Acts chapter 6. And the reason I'm sharing this all with you right now is because it's interesting that although the times have changed, 
We are not first century Rome. We are 21st century and North America. And it's, even though these times have changed, the devil's strategy and tactics and weapons remain the same. He has always used physical persecution and moral subversion and professional distraction as attempts to stop the work of the gospel. And even today, in our culture here, we may not face physical violence like they do in other parts of the world. But time and time again, we see followers of Jesus get taken out because of a moral issue or because they get so busy, even busy with good things, that there's no time for the gospel in their life. And so today, we're going to look at Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 31, which is the beginning of the persecution. So why, why were the followers of Jesus persecuted? Because they decided to follow Jesus and walk in faith. And when we elevate our thinking and choose to walk in faith, even though amazing things happen through the power of the Holy Spirit, people will persecute. And so, by the grace of God, by the power of Christ, Peter and John have just performed this amazing miracle in Acts chapter 3. And a man has been undeniably healed. He is leaping and praising God. You can't miss him. So let's see what the response is to the religious, uh, of the religious leaders to this healing. So I'm just going to read Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 4 to begin. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection from the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000 people. And that just says 5,000, it's, it's counting the number of men. If you include women and children, families, we're thinking like 10 to 20,000 people believed because of what had happened in Acts chapter 3. So as I mentioned, Acts chapter 4 and 5, two waves of persecution break out upon the disciples. And according to Luke, the author of Acts, both waves of persecution were initiated by a group of religious leaders called the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were a, a ruling class of wealthy aristocrats. Politically, they were ingratiated uh, with the Romans, and their policy was collaborate with Rome. Theologically, they believed that the Messianic age had begun hundreds of years earlier. And, and that, that the um, Messiah was not a, a person, but an ideal, their ideal. They believed they were the ones who were sort of in charge of the messianic age. And on top of that, they had no interest in the development of like biblical discussion and law. And so they denied angels, they denied Jesus, uh, they denied demons, they denied resurrection of the dead. And so here comes Peter and John teaching the people. What are they doing? They're proclaiming a Messiah, a person. They're preaching resurrection from the dead. They're disturbing the status quo. They're challenging the authority of the religious leaders and their teachings. And the Sadducees, well, they're mighty annoyed. We see in the Gospels, especially in Acts, and we see it today played out around the world, that those in power are often disturbed by the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the Sadducees, they come with other priests, they come with the captain of the guard, 
Uh, they come to Peter and John while they're speaking to the people, and they take them into custody. But because it's now evening, they're put in jail to the next day. So the next day rolls around, and we're looking at verses 5 to 7 here. Morning comes. Peter and John, they are dragged before the Sanhedrin. And look at verse 6. Who is there waiting for them? Annas and Caiaphas. Now, we've met these two people before in the Gospels because Jesus appeared before both of these religious leaders. So what do you think Peter and John were feeling? Remember, this is the very same court of Jesus' trial. This is the court, the one that, that listened to the false witnesses that unjustly condemned Jesus to death. And here, Peter and John are standing before them. What do you think they're feeling? They must have been wondering, is our fate going to be the same as Jesus is? Are we going to be handed over to the Romans to be crucified? And the first question that Luke records uh, these religious leaders asking Peter and John is in verse 7. By what power or what name did you do this? Now, if you're a careful Bible reader, again, you will note that we've heard this question before because the religious leaders ask Jesus the exact same question. By what authority are you doing these things? Once again, the gospel of Christ is making these religious leaders, people in power, very, very nervous. So Peter stands up and speaks, verses 8 to 12. And the most important factor of Peter's defense is the first eight words of verse 8, which say, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said. That is absolutely crucial. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said. What is happening here is the fulfillment of Jesus' words of warning and promise in Matthew chapter 10. And I'm going to read it to you, verses 18 to 20. This is what Jesus said. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell the rulers and other unbelievers about me. When you are arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time, for it is not you who will be speaking. It will be the spirit of your father speaking through you. What's going on with Peter and John? They are arrested. They come before the authorities, and Luke says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said... This is the fulfillment of Jesus' promise. And that phrase, filled with the Holy Spirit, is a really special phrase that's used by Luke, along with the phrase, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it depends on a person's theology. Some, some people would say these phrases may refer to two different acts of the Holy Spirit, or they may be refer to the same act of the Holy Spirit. But regardless of that, both phrases describe the presence and the activity of the Holy Spirit. And they also refer to the act of being a witness. So again, the dynamis, the power to be a martis, a witness, the power to be a witness, fulfilling the words of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, said every time Luke identifies a person at, or a group as being filled with the Holy Spirit. They are also identified either as a prophet, like with John the Baptist, or as engaging in some sort of prophetic speech. They always are about to say something. And so, so here we have that phrase used with Peter. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Whenever you read that phrase in Acts, pay attention because something special is about to happen. And in this case, Peter rattles off this incredibly inspired speech. And this is what he says. 
This is verses 8 to 12. Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders have rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Wow. And so for Peter, the beggar's physical cure was a picture of the salvation offered to all humanity through the name of Jesus Christ. And he is not going to water down his message, even if he is standing in front of the very same court that condemned his Lord to death. And then I love what Luke says next in verse 13. It's one of my favorite verses in all of Acts, in fact, in all of Scripture. Verse 13, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. So these religious leaders, these Sadducees, they saw Peter and John's courage and they noted these guys, they've had no rabbinic training and yet here they are presenting these, these theological arguments while the indisputable fact of a healed beggar is standing right beside them, leaping and praising God. No wonder they're astonished. And they took note. They said, these guys have been with Jesus. This is what Jesus does. He changes people. And those who seem unlikely suddenly become history makers and world shakers. The presence of God in the Holy Spirit in Peter and John allowed for them to do something, heal a beggar, and say things that astonished their enemies and made them know there is something going on here. And you know what? The presence of the Holy Spirit in you and in me can elevate our faith to the point where we too make people take notice of God. Can you imagine someone saying to you one day, what is going on? You've, you've been with Jesus, haven't you? And so the Sanhedrin, they, they remove Peter and John from the court while they have this little tete-a-tete -tete, uh, talking because they're faced with a conundrum. On the one hand, Peter and John have performed an outstanding miracle. And everyone in Jerusalem knows about it. So the Sanhedrin, they, they can't deny it. I mean, they could deny the miracle if they they or they would have denied the miracle if they could have but they they couldn't and then on the other hand they have no disposition to be convinced by what peter and john are saying and they want to stop this thing from spreading any further but they couldn't punish peter and john because everyone was praising god for what happened so again those people in power, they are threatened by the gospel. I mean, why, why would they not want to see this happen more often? Why would they not want to see more people healed, more miracles? Because it would destabilize their hold on the people. And often, people love control more than they love God. And that's what's happening here. And so they call... Peter and John back in and they tell them, don't preach the gospel anymore. 
don't preach in the name of Jesus like that's going to work. I mean, come on. These guys have just performed a miracle. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this inspired prophetic speech. And then the Sanhedrin says, um, please don't preach anymore. It's not going to work. I mean, these are two men. This is what one commentator said. He says, here's two men whose lives have been transformed by being with Jesus, by God's having raised Jesus from the dead and the coming of the Holy Spirit. As with the prophets of old, God's word was in Peter's and John's hearts like a burning fire, and they could neither contain it or restrain, be restrained from speaking. And so Peter and John reply, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Again, they cannot stop being a witness because they are filled with this burning passion that is being fanned into flame by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so what do the apostles do in reaction to the Sanhedrin's ban and threats? Well, this is what it says. We're looking in verse 23 and on. It says, they went back to their own people. They reported everything that had happened and everyone turned together in prayer to God. And there is something to be said for the way these people, this little church, newborn church, there's something to be said for the way they pray. That's in verses 24 to 30. I'm not going to read the whole prayer. But this is what happens. Before they ask anything, they fill their mind with thoughts of divine sovereignty and who God is. They remind themselves who God is. They call him sovereign Lord. The Greek word there is actually a term that is usually referred to a slave owner with unchallengeable power. So they're calling him sovereign Lord, the one with unchallengeable power. They call him, they remember that he is the God of creation. Verse 24, they say, you made. They remember that he is the God of revelation. Verse 25 and 26, they say, you spoke. They remember that he is the God of history. Verse 27, 28, they say, you decided. Now, this is the important point, church. God already knows this about himself. He knows who he is. So why are the disciples saying these things? Not for God's benefit, for their benefit. They are building up their faith. If you're going to ask God for big things, then first remind yourself that God is a big God that he is the God of creation. He is the God of revelation. He is the God of history. We build up our faith. And these disciples who are so bold in their speech to the Sanhedrin are equally bold in their prayer. And we can learn from their prayer. This is what they ask in verses 29 and 30. I love it. They say, and now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Here's another interesting thing. Like, they, they're, they're just beginning, entering into this time of persecution. But did you notice one thing that they don't pray for? They don't pray for relief from oppression or judgment or suffering. I don't know if you notice that because it's so, it's so unlike us today. Like, honestly, when I suffer or when I feel oppressed, Usually the first thing that I ask is make it stop. I, 
I pray for relief. But the disciples here, they don't. They're not praying for relief from oppression. They pray for enablement in spite of the oppression that they're facing, in spite of the circumstances. Their concern is not for their personal comfort. Their concern is for God's word to go forth and for Christ's name to be glorified. And they leave their circumstances in the hands of God. Now, that's obviously, I'm, that's not to say that, that we should never ask God for help in our circumstances, but it means that our number one prayer is to ask God to help us follow his will despite any circumstances we face, right? We cannot say to God, when you change my circumstances, then I can follow your will. We say, no, I want to follow your will all the time, regardless of my circumstances. Give me the power and the enablement to do that. And then we leave the circumstances in God's hands. And yes, by all means, we can say, please change them. But even if they don't change, help me, give me the power, the dynamis to continue to be your witness, your martyrs. That's a prayer of faith. That these disciples would, would trust God enough to allow him to take care of their circumstances. So they pray, consider their threats, they say. Enable your servants, stretch out your hand. Even though they are being persecuted by religious leaders, when they pray for miracles, they do not pray for miracles of vengeance. They don't pray for miracles of destruction, like bring down the fire from heaven. They pray for miracles of mercy. They say, stretch out your hand and bring healing to the people. And in answer to their prayer, we see verse 31. In answer to their prayer, God shows up. And it says, after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all what? Filled with the Holy Spirit and they preached the word of God with boldness. Again, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The power, the dynamis came. And what happened? They spoke, they preached the word of God. The, they were the martyrs, the witnesses for God. And so in conclusion, let me just ask us this. Can we today cry out to God like they did, like this early church did? Do we have the hunger? Do we have the desperation to cry out like they did? Have we walked that walk of faith where we have had to depend upon God. Or sometimes we like to kind of hold back a little bit, just in case. But God today, I believe, wants us to go all in with him. To say all in, I want, no matter what, I want to be your witness. May my words, may my actions, may my character, may my attitude all bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. And when we have a prayer like that, the promise, the pattern we see in Acts is God gives us the power to do that. That's why he fills us with his Holy Spirit. God is calling us to more, both as, as like a church in, in the city, but also as individuals. God is calling us to more. And what I want to say this morning is don't settle for less. Think big. Believe big. Remind yourself that God is big. So I'm going to ask Pastor JB to come back up and close us with prayer. Can we give God a big hand together right now? Praise God.
I want to thank Pastor Nick Osborne for that message today, Acts chapter 4. In a minute, we're going to pray together. Because here at Thrive, we believe that with prayer, there's power. In fact, we have a saying here at Thrive, which is much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little, no prayer. And because we believe prayer is powerful, because we believe that prayer changes our perspective, because we believe that the same God that Peter and John prayed to 2,000 years ago in Acts 4 is the same God that we pray to today, we believe that with God all things are possible. And it's with that in mind that we want to come to God today with an attitude of faith. Pastor Nick had said, you know, who's going to cry out to God the way they did then today? Well, we're going to do some of that in just a minute. But before we do any of that, let me just say this one thing. If you're here and you're, you're new to all this Christianity stuff, you're new to Jesus, all this stuff, you're kind of like, what's the big deal? What's this all about? Like, like can I say it just as simply as I possibly can? Let me say it to you this way. God loves you that God loves you so much, he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross to pay for our sins. That when we had no way of reaching God, when our sins separated us from God, such that we couldn't reach God no matter how hard we tried, no matter how good we think we are, when we had no way of reaching God on our own, God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins, to pay the penalty that we were supposed to pay, to pay the debt that we owed to God. God did that out of love for you and for me, because you matter to God. We turn and say, you matter to God. You matter to God. And it's because of Jesus' name that we've got forgiveness for our sin, not our resume, not the good things that we do, not the good that we think we are, none of that. It's none that could ever get to God, but because God loved us, He got to us by sending Jesus Christ for us. And if you've never opened up your heart to Jesus, then I encourage you, I urge you, I beg you today to not wait till tomorrow to do that. Do it today. Open your heart to Jesus and ask Him to forgive your sins. It's the most important thing you could possibly do in life. You know, I've got a three-year-old son. His name is Caleb. And back about a couple years ago, when COVID was just starting to be a thing, we would go to the grocery store. And because I was a little bit concerned about, you know, wanting to protect him. And so he was someone who loves to push buttons. Sometimes my buttons, but not just my buttons, but different buttons. And there'd be one, there's one time when like, we'd go into this elevator and he'd love to push buttons. Whole, thankfully, not every button, but like one of the buttons, you know, the up button, the next floor button. And he'd want to push it. And, and in past times, I'd be like, yeah, go ahead and push it. But because, like, you know, there's all this stuff going on, like with COVID and all that, I was like, okay, go ahead and pu push the button. And whenever he'd push the button, I'd always make sure that my hand was there to like kind of underneath his finger so that I'm touching the button, not him. And why do I mention that? It's because Jesus did something very, very similar to that is that when we deserved to touch the cross and die on a cross, Jesus died on that cross for us. Jesus touched wood so that you wouldn't have to. And when we open up our heart to Jesus, when we say, Jesus, I'm a sinner who needs a savior, and we ask Jesus for his forgiveness, how he paid for it on the cross, then the Bible says we have forgiveness for real. We have forgiveness for good. We have a relationship with God that none of our good works could ever get to us. And the reason we do good now isn't to earn anything. It's in response to God's amazing love. If you believe that, would you give God some praise in this place together right now? Amen. Amen. And so it's that in mind that I want you to take this into consideration today. Have I put my faith in Jesus? Or am I placing my faith in myself? I want to invite you right now all to stand. And we're going to, before we sing a song, I'm just going to invite you to pray with me an important prayer. And if you've never prayed this prayer before, I can tell you this is the most important prayer you can pray. And you don't have to have gone to church all your life. You don't have to have read the Bible before. All you need to know is I'm a sinner who needs a Savior. All I need to know, all you need to know to pray this prayer is to realize, thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, doing something for me that I could never do myself. And if you want to receive that forgiveness today, then I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me right now with every head bowed and every eye closed. If that's you and you realize that you are someone who needs God's forgiveness, we all are. But if you realize that for yourself today, because I can't do that for you, no one else can. Your mom can't do that for you. Your husband can't do that for you. Your friend can't do that for you. You have to make that acknowledgement yourself. If you realize today that you are a sinner who needs a savior and you want Jesus to be your savior, you want Jesus to forgive your sins, I would invite you right now, just lift up your hand to God right now. And let the height of your hand just reflect your honesty. Let the height of your hand reflect your, you know, just, just your, your humility, your sincerity. And what's going to happen if you're on site with us, then one of our team members might give you a little card with a prayer 
are on it that we're going to pray in just a second. Maybe you're online. You can do the same thing. You can click the link that's on your chat room right there. It's going to take you the same prayer that we're going to pray together right now. And it's a simple way for us to simply ask Jesus for his forgiveness today. This is not between you and your neighbor. This is between you and God. So I want to encourage you to pray this prayer from your heart because heaven hears you. God hears you. Would you just pray this with me in support of those praying it for the first time? Let's all pray this let out loud together. Just repeat this after me. Say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. Thank you that because you love me, you died on the cross to pay for my sins. You rose again to give me life. Today, I open up my heart and I ask you, please forgive me of all my sins and please fill me with your Holy Spirit. I place my trust not in what I do, but in what you've done for me. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer and you meant that, then we're so happy for you. Congratulations. The Bible says that just by placing your faith in Jesus, you are forgiven of your sins. And just as like in Acts chapter 2, Peter says, believe and be baptized. I want to encourage you to do the same. And, you know, if you are here and you've placed your trust in Jesus today, you've done that first part. You believed in Jesus. I want to encourage you as an evidence of that faith to go and get baptized. And if you want help with that, we'd love to help you with that. Next week, we've got Baptism Sunday going on. You go to mythrive.info, sign up for baptism there. We'd love to help you with that. Baptism is simply you taking a simple step to say, yes, I've received Jesus Christ in my life. It's not saying, oh, look how committed I am. Look, I'm never going to make a mistake again. It's about you saying, I thank God for sending me the Savior I need. His name is Jesus. And if you've never taken that step before, I encourage you to take that step this coming Sunday. Please take that step. We encourage you to do that. And if you're wondering how we're going to do it, we're not going to do it here, all right? Uh, we're going to be doing it, uh, you know, at uh, a location that we're going to coordinate with you on, something where you can invite your friends and make it safe and comfortable for you so that you feel, you know, even this kind of COVID climate still, that, that you feel like, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a safe, secure way to do it. So just, you just sign up at mythrod.info slash baptism for that. And we'd love to help you with that. Can we give God a big hand in this place right now? Praise God. Good morning, Thrive. We're so excited to see you all today. My name is Christine, and I hope you had a fantastic time today here at Thrive. Before we end off, let's jump into some announcements and take a look at what's coming up here at Thrive. If this is your first time joining us, we want to show you how much we appreciate you being here today by giving you a Thrive stainless steel water bottle. Simply scan the QR code at the back of your seat or visit mythrive.info and click new to Thrive to fill out the connect card. If you joined us online, we'll mail you the gift as soon as possible. And if you're here with us today at Lepont Place, please drop by the Welcome Center by the exit door after the service to pick up your gift. Once again, thanks so much for worshiping with us today. If you've made the decision to receive Jesus Christ into your life, then baptism is your next step. Our next Baptism Sunday is happening on July 24th. Baptism is one of the most exciting things we do here at Thrive, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. To sign up, please visit mythrive.info. For all the parents here at Thrive, we're just one month away to our very first Thrive Kids VBS summer camp called Make Wave from August 2nd to 5th. If you have children ages three to nine, we can't wait to welcome them for an exciting week of games, activities, and crafts. Your kids will also learn how to make a positive impact and share God's love with the people around them. For more information or to sign up, visit mythrive.info. If you haven't already, we want to encourage you to get plugged in at Thrive by joining a small group or by being a part of a serving team. This is the best way to meet new friends and to develop meaningful relationships with other Thrivers. To sign up, please visit mythrive.info. All right, so that concludes our announcements today. If you believe in the mission of Thrive and would like to contribute towards it, I highly encourage you to head on over to mythrive.info and click online giving. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of the week. I'll see you next week online and on site at Lepont Place. See you soon.